Good morning. Welcome. Great to have you in this morning as we worship the Father, Son, and Spirit with an eye to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, Just a couple of directions with seating for this morning. If you could, as you are able, please scoot in toward the middle of your rows. Uh, Even now at this time, as we welcome in those uh, who arrive in the next few minutes as we welcome them. Uh, thank you for that. And then next, we absolutely love having children of all ages uh, in the sanctuary with us throughout the service. Um, if needed, we have a cry room uh, for those caring for young infants on the other side of the wall over here in the back. And then for those children, like maybe my own, who have a little bit more wiggles than usual this morning. We have an overflow uh, seating room over here on the other side of this wall. Um, All right, let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts for worship. One way you can do that is using the reflection in the bulletin and then project it up behind me. Let's prepare our hearts for worship now. God now calls us to worship. Please stand as you are able. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory in might forever and ever. Please pray with me now. Father in heaven, we come together this morning to sing to you, to make a joyful noise to you, the rock of our salvation. You are the one true God, a great king above all gods. You are greatly to be praised and to be feared above all gods because all other gods are worthless idols. But you made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before you, and strength and beauty are in your sanctuary. We come to worship and bow down to kneel before you, Lord, our Maker. Glorify the name of your everlasting Son, who lives forever, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. Please follow along as I read God's word. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. This is God's word. We're going to move now to a time of confession where we confess our sins together and then individually. Uh, And this time reminds us that it's only by the mercy and grace of God that we have any confidence to come before Him. In Christ, we have full assurance to approach the throne of grace and to confess our sins. So let's do that now together. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. In his name we pray, amen. Let's take a moment now to silently confess your sins to the Father now. O Lord, our God, you remember our frame. You know our frame and remember that we are dust. You made us in your image, and we have fallen short of your glory. And yet, that was not enough for you to give up on us completely. And instead, you have raised us from death to life in your Son. And we praise the work of Jesus this morning that makes it possible by his suffering and death and burial and then being raised back to life by you. We have hope to be raised as well. And even now, we are spiritually raised to new life in Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. Lord, it is mysterious, but it is true. And it's true only because of the faith that you have given us. We praise you. We praise you for this hope that we have, an inheritance laid up for us in heaven. Lord, we praise your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now these words of forgiveness from the passage that will be preached here in a moment from Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Praise be to Christ this morning. Let's stand now as we continue in worship. confess together what it is that we believe as Christians using uh, the Apostles' Creed. So let's confess it together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, everlasting. Amen. You may 
may be seated. Let's turn to our Heavenly Father in prayer. And my prayer is going to be around asking God to make the resurrection a reality in our hearts. And that's what we're asking this morning, that the reality of the resurrection would assure our hearts of certain things this morning. So bow with me as we pray. Father, we rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Lord Jesus, you are alive. Your tomb is still empty. You are ascended. You are at God's right hand, and you have all authority in heaven and on earth. And so, Father, I ask that the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ might this morning assure our hearts that Jesus is indeed your only begotten Son, that He is truly God and truly man, King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, I ask that the resurrection of Jesus Christ might assure and convince our hearts that Jesus' sacrifice has indeed been accepted and that in His death and burial and resurrection, He was our substitute bearing our sin and paying our debt. Assure our hearts this morning that the claims of your perfect justice have been satisfied and there is no more wrath reserved for us. Father, I ask that the resurrection of Jesus Christ might assure our hearts that just as Jesus has been raised to life, so we too have been raised to new life in him. Oh, Father, I ask that you would make real to us our union with Christ, that we have died with Him, with relationship to sin, that we've been buried with Him, and that we have been made to come to life in Him. Enable us, Father, to walk as Your people in newness of life. Father, I ask that the resurrection of Jesus Christ might assure our hearts that Jesus has conquered sin and death and hell and Satan, and everything that stands against us. Open our eyes to the reality that Jesus' victory is our victory, that the prison doors have been opened, that we can go free, and that we need no longer walk in darkness or in bondage. And I ask, Father, that you would so stir our hearts with the wonder of this salvation that we join with Christ in proclaiming this good news to others who are afflicted and held captive. Father, I ask this morning that the reality and the historicity of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ might this morning assure our hearts of your great promise that one day we too shall receive resurrected and glorified physical bodies. Father, cause us to rejoice in Jesus' resurrection as being a foretaste, a preview of what is to come. Cause us by faith and full of hope to eagerly long and wait for that day when there will be no more pain, no more tears, no more sickness, no more hurt, no more pain. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So I ask, Father, that you would do this mighty work in our hearts this morning. That you would do it through the ministry of your word. That you would do it by the supernatural and illuminating work of your spirit. And I ask this all in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Children five and under are now dismissed the children's church through the back door.
Good morning. He is risen. Risen indeed. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52 is where we will begin in verse 13. And we'll conclude our passage will this morning in 53 verses 12, verse 12. Now while you're turning there, I want to tell you a story that Paul Miller tells in a book. It's about Michael Richards. By the way, Paul Miller is a Christian, and he leads a Christian ministry. He tells a story about Michael Richards. Now, some of you, when you hear the name Michael Richards, might, might immediately know who I am talking about. But if you do not know who I'm talking about, it's, it's Kramer from Seinfeld. All right, that's Michael Richards. Now, this is a sad story. It's a hard story, actually, in the life of Michael Richards. So he's a stand-up comic. He's doing, he's doing his thing. It's live. He has an audience. And, at, you know, in this day and age, there's videos, etc. And he's getting heckled while he's on stage. There's a man in the crowd, and he's giving him a really hard time. And he's getting worked up. He's having some difficulty. And in a moment of utter weakness, in that moment that we've all been there, but in a very public way, and in a very viral way, because this video went viral, he looks at a man who was a black man, a different race than him. And he began in a very harsh way to talk about what would have happened to that man 50 years ago, then asked for him to be thrown out, and then racial slurs followed um, that comment. The video went viral, YouTube eventually takes it down, but he's so beat up about it that he, he with Jerry Seinfeld, who's a, who's a good friend of his, they want to kind of do atonement for this. So what Jerry Seinfeld works out is for Michael Richards to go on the David Letterman show. I've seen the clip. I don't know, maybe you've, you've, you've seen it as well. He goes on, and this is, some, this is what he said live on the David Letterman show. Michael Richards speaking. I said some pretty nasty things to some African Americans. You know, I'm really busted up over this, and I'm very, very sorry. He didn't get over it. And, and in fact, years later, Jerry Seinfeld's trying to redeem his friend, so he invites him onto uh, the show Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. And they're sitting down, and this is what Richard says. He says, I, I, I'm busted up after that event seven years ago. He carried this for seven years. It broke me down. This is what Seinfeld says. That's up to you to say I've been carrying this bag long enough. I'm going to put it down. So Seinfeld, in that moment, looks at him and says, you've been carrying it long enough. Put it down. And Richards just could not in that moment. This is what he says. Yeah, yeah. Here's what Paul Miller writes. See, Richards couldn't put it down because he knew that he couldn't justify himself. To justify is to, 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 to be pardoned, to be declared in the right. And he couldn't do it. And then he tried justification by Seinfeld, but Jerry Seinfeld didn't have the power to look at him and say, you're forgiven, you're righteous. And even his confession or forgiving himself didn't work. And here's what Paul Miller's conclusion is. The reason those things didn't work is because only God can justify. Now, our passage is very good news for Michael Richards. And it's very good news for us. Because as Ray Ortland Jr. puts it, people. But how does he do it? That's the question. And that's the question that's actually looming over our text. The text before us is what is called the fourth servant song. If you're just dialing in right now, we're in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. This is the fourth poem that speaks of a servant that will come that is going to accomplish God's promises. God's people in this moment are very aware of their failure. God has made great promises to justify, to welcome guilty people. But the question is looming, 
How will you do that? And our passage answers that question. Now, before we read it, I'm going to tell you this. This passage, the New Testament reveals to us, is speaking about Jesus Christ. He is the servant in this passage. So how does God welcome guilty people? Jesus takes our guilt, and Jesus gives us his righteousness. That is what this passage teaches. And before I read God's word, I just want to say I am indebted to Ray Ortland Jr. and Dane Ortland, father-son duo, both pastors, Tim Keller, Sinclair Ferguson, and Alec Motier. Here is God's word. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Before we continue, we're going to pray. I want you to quietly in your own heart pray for the people around you that they would hear the voice of this servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning. Pray quietly in your heart. Now pray for your own heart. that you would be dead certain, you could walk out of here this morning, that your guilt is taken away, and that Jesus has given you his righteousness. And if you believe that truth, ask that God would take it deeper in your heart this morning. Now pray for the preacher. That I would believe the very truths that I proclaim and proclaim them with clarity.
Lord Jesus Christ, we believe that you speak to us through your word, and we ask that you would do that this morning. Would you preach to us? Would you preach your death on our behalf and your resurrection on our behalf? And I pray that you'd bring about new joy, new peace, new freedom, new life. That's what your resurrection does. Where there is death, there comes life. And you delight to do that. So, do that this morning. We pray, Jesus. Amen. Jesus removes our guilt, and Jesus gives us his righteousness. Pick up with me in chapter 52, verse 13. Now, I want to just give you the lay of the land real fast. We're not going to be able to squeeze all the water out of this sponge. It would take a lifetime and more. This is a masterpiece of poetry, and it really unpacks the heart of Christianity. But what I want you to see is some structure so you don't get turned around. There are five stanzas of three verses each. The first stanza is a bit of a summary. The second stanza goes into the birth and life of this servant. The third stanza tells you what his life and death meant. The fourth stanza picks back up with his life. And then the fifth stanza again brings meaning. What, what does this all mean? So chapter 52, verse 13, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. Wisely here is not just, oh, he's going to make good decisions or be cautious and not get into trouble. The word here means he's going to be successful. He's going to set out to do something, and he will know exactly how to do it, and he's going to be successful in it. In fact, his success will mean that he is going to be highly exalted but there's mystery here because not only will he be exalted, but he's going to experience intense humiliation. In fact, it's going to be horrific. He is going to experience violence and torture such that people, if you look at verse 14, will question when they see his level of suffering, is this man even human? And then 53 verse 1. Well, let's go to verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. This is speaking of his birth, his growing up. Jesus' life was very ordinary. In fact, when Jesus was going about his ministry, there were people who go, wasn't that the carpenter's son? After the Maundy Thursday service, I had a man who's a carpenter in our church come up to me with his young son. And his young son goes, I... He takes something out of his pocket, and it was a tape measure. And I thought to myself, Dad, you know, just like his father, you know, he wants to be a carpenter like his father. And that's how people looked at Jesus. He's, he's just the, the carpenter's son. We've wiped his nose in nursery. We've changed his diapers. There's nothing much very special about this man. In fact, Isaiah continues in verse 3 and says that there was no form or majesty or beauty. There was nothing impressive about Jesus. If you saw him walking down, down downtown Greenville, he would pass by you and you wouldn't even notice him. You wouldn't be thinking to yourself, okay, this is God in the flesh. I heard one pastor say he had a face that only a mama could love. And he didn't have the right resume either. He didn't have the right degrees from the right institution. He didn't have the right last name. He wasn't connected, he wasn't published, he wasn't well-traveled. And this is why Isaiah says, in his question in verse 1, who, who has believed what he has heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That, that word, the, the phrase, arm of the Lord, is speaking of the power of God to save. It's the power of God to welcome guilty people. Here's all these promises. There's this great expectation that God will enter into our story and welcome guilty people. And this is Isaiah's point. Who would have believed unless it was revealed, unless God shows us that this was his plan? He, what he's saying is the arm of the Lord is Jesus. No one would have planned it. Or if, if you were to take Say, God, come in the flesh to earth. How would you lay that whole plan out? 
Not the way God did. But instead of acceptance, Jesus faced rejection. In fact, his life was marked with suffering. Look at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by man. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with, meaning he had personal, first-hand experience, knowledge with grief. Men hid their faces from Jesus. What does that mean? We went to Florida on spring break a couple weeks ago, and right before we got off the exit, there was a horrific accident that we had just pulled up on. It was at night. It's dark. All the emergency vehicles are there, and we're one of the first cars. And I don't want to go into detail, because that's not the point this morning, but it took 45 minutes for emergency personnel to get into one vehicle. Two helicopters had to come. No one died, though. There were many that were critically injured, to our knowledge. But here's what I wanted to say. As a dad, when you're sitting in the car and your children are in the back seat, that's something you want to hide your faces from. In fact, there were some some young 20-somethings who were standing outside our car. This is Florida. It's hot. It's humid. So our windows are down. Our engine's off. I mean, we're, we're there for a long time. And they start talking about the accident. And I got out of my car, kindly walked over to them. I go, I got some young children in the car. Can you please stop talking? And they were gracious. And, but that's the point. Hide their faces. As people looked at Jesus, they said, this is, this is too horrific. What is happening to him? But I want you to catch here something. This wasn't just that it was gruesome or it was horrific of what was happening to Jesus on the cross. Do you look in verse 4. Surely. Surely is a word of unexpected. See, it wasn't just that it was horrific, but what people were concluding at the day was this. He is cursed by God. He has done something and he is paying for it. See, Roman crucifixion, which was not original to the... Roman crucifixion was a death penalty where slaves, rebels, criminals were punished, but certainly not a Roman citizen. Even the Romans saw how horrific it was and they wouldn't subject their own citizens to crucifixion. And the Jews also... Saul, that it was so horrific. In fact, if a man was hanging on a tree, there's a verse in the Old Testament that says this, he was cursed by God. So when the Jews are looking at Jesus on the cross, this is their conclusion. All that stuff he did and said does not please God. In fact, he's finally getting what he deserved. He's cursed by God. The wrath of God is on him. And children... That is not what you want to be when you grow up right there. That is the end of those who blaspheme God and rebel against the Roman Empire. And then Isaiah says this, we esteemed him, verse 4, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted that God's face had turned away from him and that's actually a correct conclusion. God's face was against him. He was experiencing the curse of God. But here's the turn. Isaiah is saying, it wasn't for his sin. It was for yours. When you look at Jesus on the cross, you're looking into a mirror of your own sin and what your sin deserves. He has borne our griefs. He's lifted them off of us. He's carried our sorrows, meaning he's shouldered our sorrow. Verse 5, he was pierced. This is to be pierced fatally to the point of death for our transgressions. Do you see what happened to Jesus? Look, he was, he was crushed. He was trampled to death, completely destroyed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement or punishment that brought us peace. And it's by his wounds that we are healed. What's a transgression? Very simply, it's what we think about when we just step over the line. When, when you heard the story of Michael Richards, and if I were to read what he actually said, everyone in here would say, that crossed the line. 
that just didn't, that didn't just cross the line. That destroyed the line. See, a transgression is when we, we cross over the line. But it's not just what is socially acceptable, but it's what God views as acceptable and as pleasing. And see, when Michael Richards, when he said those words, it wasn't just the words that were the issue. What I'm getting at is sin is not just our outward actions or our behaviors or our words. At the depth of sin is a heart. Jesus said this, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what was revealed, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to put just completely slam Richards here. I could tell you stories of my own life that are worse. And you can too. But what's in that heart? There's, there's a hatred, there's an envy, there's an anger, there's a bitterness. And it came out when he was squeezed in that moment. See, at the heart of sin is a rebellion against God. There's an author named Tony Payne, and he wrote a little book. It's called The Christian Gospel. It explains what Christians believe. It's available um, in our foyer, free of cost, our gift to you. But in that book, he writes about sin and says this, it's the essence of the human problem. We've all rebelled against the ruler and creator of the world. Now listen, here, listen to this nuance. Some of us do this very decisively and blatantly. We turn our backs on God. We shake our fist in his face. Some of us are more subtle about it. We just ignore God. We ghost him. We block his number. We get on with life without him. Some of us even manage to live quite respectable lives and regard ourselves as pretty decent people. But we're still strangers to the God whom we are supposed to serve and obey. We're like good, upstanding pirates whom all other pirates regard as the brightest and the best, but we're still pirates flying under our own flag as rebels against the true king. That is the essence of sin, as what Isaiah says in verse 6, that we have gone our own way. We said, God, we're not interested. We believe that we can do life best, be happiest, be most fulfilled, not by coming under you and you as God, but we believe that we can be the happiest and most fulfilled if we reject you, God. And what does our culture have done right now? It's elevated the individual to the place of God by saying this as one Jim Ad put it. There's no right way, there's no wrong way, there's just your way. And when you become the judge of right or wrong, who are you putting yourself in the position of? You're putting yourself in the position of God. So this is the essence of sin. Sin is this. You substitute yourself for God. And what's the heart of the Christian gospel, as John Stott puts it? We substitute ourselves for God, and this is what God does. He substitutes himself for us. When Jesus was flogged and whipped, and there was a whip, it was called the cat of nine tails, and in it was broken pieces of glass or bone or even metal, and it laid into his skin. And it ripped him apart such that you questioned, is this even a man? That level of suffering was motivated by a love for you as he bore your sin. And as he hung upon the cross, that physical suffering... That public humiliation wasn't the depth of what Jesus experienced on the cross. It was that the Father turned his face away because as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus became sin. He lifted it off our shoulders and he carried it. He became it. What love? See, as one pastor puts it, the heart of Christianity, if you're, what is Christianity? It is not that God condemns or that he judges, though he certainly does that if you're not in Christ. It is not, here, God instructs, he teaches, or he gives you an example to live your life, though that is true. That is not the heart of Christianity. The heart of Christianity, if you do not hear another word this morning, it is this, God substitutes. That is the heart of Christianity. 
Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice to call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. That's the depth of the love of the, of the God of the universe. You want to wonder how the, how the God welcomes guilty people and enters into stories? It is that way, by God substituting himself. But Jesus doesn't just take our guilt. He also gives us his righteousness. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. What that is saying is that Jesus was submissive. And and the example given is like a lamb or a sheep going before its shears. It was silent. Jesus didn't say this. As As he went to a trial before Herod and before Pilate, as he was betrayed and as people mocked him, and they, as they crucified him, as he walked through everything, he didn't say this, this is unjust. I'm the only righteous man that's ever lived. He didn't do that. You know what he did when he was stood before Herod and he stood before Pilate? He didn't say this is unjust. As Ferguson, Sinclair Ferguson puts it, he pled guilty. He stood in our place and said, Guilty. And then look at verse 8. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? That's speaking of an unjust trial and his arrest. And then verse 9. He was buried. Although he had done no violence, speaking of outward behavior, and there was no deceit in his mouth, meaning all, every single one of Jesus Christ's actions Every single word that he ever spoke was absolutely perfect and full of love. Even his, down to his heart motivation, he was completely guiltless. And that willingness to go to death and that obedience is completely necessary. Not only did Jesus need to die for you, but he needed to live for you. Now look at verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Let's continue down a little bit longer. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. That term, prolong his days. Every time it's used, it's used to speak of someone who has a really long life. Did you know that this is the only place where it's spoken of somebody who died? This is a clear reference to the resurrection. That Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. And his resurrection is so important. It won something for us. Verse 11 says this, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. He shall make many to be accounted righteous. See, it was completely necessary that Jesus had a perfect life because not only does Jesus take away our guilt, but then he takes his perfect record of righteousness and he gives it to us. That word that describes that is to justify. Justify is a legal term that means to look at somebody and to declare them as righteous. And this verse is saying this, that Jesus not only bore our guilt, but that when people place their faith and trust in him, God can accept them as righteous and welcome them as if they had lived a perfect life. What did Michael Richards look for? He didn't just look for forgiveness. He looked for a sense of, I'm okay. I'm righteous. Every single person is searching for a sense that I'm righteous, not only before other people, but that I'm righteous before God. And this is what Jesus offers 
us. And here why, here is why the resurrection is so important. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when you, this morning, it's Easter, we've, we've sung about, we've prayed about Jesus, and they're rising from the dead, and there are many promises that we can cling to as God's people, but there is one that I want you to cling to and rest in, and your heart to be completely assured that when you hear this word, Jesus rose from the dead, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is true for you. Okay? And here's where I want to go. Okay? Richard Gaffin points out this, and he says this, it was completely necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead, because if he would have stayed dead, he had a sentence of condemnation hanging over him. And if Jesus were still dead today, it would be correct to come to the conclusion that he was a condemned man cursed by God. But his rising from the dead was God vindicating him. It was him, God declaring him, this is, he, he, he was perfect. He is completely innocent, and he is my son. And not only does the resurrection do that, but Romans 4.25, follow me. This is the logic here. Next step. His resurrection means that we are justified. How can that be? See, Jesus identified with us in his condemnation such that we are identified with him in his justification. This is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Here's what Gaffin writes. An unraised Christ is an unjustified Christ. And an unjustified Christ means an unjustified believer. Here's the conclusion I came to. To say he is risen, he is risen indeed, is to say this, I'm accepted. I'm accepted indeed. I am welcomed and I am treated as righteous. Now I want to point out a couple observations. And then we're going to really dig into what this means. Look at verse 10. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. This was God's purpose and plan from the very beginning. And it wasn't just a purpose and plan where God was like, okay, there's no other way. We just got to do it this way. That word there means there was a, this was his good pleasure. There's, I don't want to be misinterpreted here. There was delight And you want to know what that delight was? That delight was not in what happened to Jesus, but that delight was that God delights to welcome guilty people. That's God's will. And then look at the end of verse 10. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus is risen from the dead in heaven, and this is what he's doing. He's executing. He's carrying out. The will of the Father. And what is the will of the Father? To welcome guilty people. That's, you you ask, like, what is Jesus doing right now? That's what Jesus is doing. He's welcoming people. And saying, I bore your guilt, and I want to give you my righteousness. And then I I I want you to see this in verse 10. No, verse 11, the very beginning of it. See The first phrase, look at it. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. One commentator writes, Christ is satisfied. Why? Listen to this, and I hope this rings in your ears like it has to me. Because he's the kind of person who enjoys clearing sinners of their guilt and accounting them righteous. If you have grown up in a church or if you have grown up in a household and your idea of Jesus or of the Father is that he is a distant judge who's just waiting for you to mess up, who's very critical of you, who bears with you, who just puts up with you because they got to love you. He's got to love you. And your idea of Jesus is not that he welcomes and enjoys and delights to bring you near. Then you're not thinking of 
the biblical Jesus. His soul delights in you. Out of the anguish of his soul, the pain and suffering that he did on the cross, do you want to know that delight when he looks at it and he says, it was completely successful. It took yours and yours and yours. It took all your guilt away. And then when he sees that he gives you his perfect righteousness, he sits back and he delights. He enjoys, he delights in you. That's the heart of our Father. It's the heart of our Savior. Now, I want to make sure we're clear about this. And, and uh, to, to be clear, I want to steal something from Dane Ortland. And I want to do a thought experiment that I think is very helpful. I want you to picture there's a, there's a Christian here this morning. I want you to picture there's a second Christian here this morning. And then there's a third person who's not a Christian here this morning. Now, I'm going to describe each of these people to you, and I'm going to ask you a question. First person, Christian, real deal believer, the real thing, all right? They, they, they believe the gospel, but their life is a dumpster fire, okay? Completely in shambles. Um, they're, they're, they're sitting here, and they're saying, okay, Michael Richards, nothing, <laughs> nothing. In fact, I'm so ashamed of what's going on in my life right now, I don't want to bring it forward. There's secret addiction. There's some things going on in my life, and I am just in hiding. Okay, that's person number one. Person number two, real deal believer. They're a Christian. They believe the gospel, and they're crushing it. Faithful, faithful spouse. I mean, talk about patience, like, could, could compete with Mother Teresa. Giving of their money, serving faithfully, haven't been in service in five weeks because they're constantly in the nursery. Okay? Now I want you to picture this non-Christian. Someone sitting. Good, upstanding woman. has led her, her business with complete integrity, never cheated on her taxes, treats her employees with justice, fair wages, volunteers her time coaching basketball. I mean, and, and she's concerned not just about wins on the court, but she's concerned about these young women becoming, you know, women of character. And therefore, every kid wants, every, every parent wants their kid on her team in the Little League. You know, when her husband's not cutting the grass, she cuts it, and she even cuts that little piece of grass in the middle of the cul-de-sac. Everybody loves her. Now, here's my question to you. Who is righteous before God? Person number one, Christian, though their life is a dumpster fire, before the Father, 10 out of 10 completely righteous, accepted and treated, and everything that happens in that person's life, though the Father may discipline them, is always motivated by love. And that person will always be treated and accepted as if they had lived a perfect life with Jesus. That is scandalous. Person number two, 10 out of 10, completely righteous before the Father. And it's not because of anything they have done. The Father looks at that person and He treats them and accepts them based on the righteousness of Jesus. Third person. A person that we would look to in this world and say that is a moral, moral person. In fact, I trust them with my children when I'm not even looking. In the eyes of God, zero out of ten. Not one ounce of righteousness. And that is the beauty and the scandal of the gospel is that Jesus Christ offers us a righteousness and an acceptance before God. And Christian, I want you to hear me on this. We struggle to believe that deep down, the Father, we, we, are, we are like Pharisees who look to our record and what we've done to get, come to a conclusion 
of whether we are accepted. And I want you to know this. Every moment of every day, the Father accepts you and treats you as righteous because as the end of verse 12 said, Jesus is interceding for you. Because he pled guilty in your place, do you want to know what he pleads every day before the Father? Your innocence. And your righteousness. And not that he has to twist the Father's arm, but he's saying, look, look to me and my work. Look to my merit, my virtue. This person is completely righteous. And whenever you hear the accusations that you're not, when your conscience condemns you, you look to Jesus and you say, well, I've done worse than that. But Jesus has paid for it and I am righteous in him. And that brings a joy and a freedom and a deep peace before God. And then it changes the whole way you live which I can't go into right now because my time is up. And if you have not come to Jesus, if you're still substituting, putting your place in the place of God, I want you to hear clearly this morning that Jesus doesn't come to you this morning with a club over your head waiting for you to cry, uncle. He comes to you gently, and he comes to you lowly, and he offers you his hands that have been pierced, and he offers you the wounds, and he says this, peace. I offer you peace, acceptance with God. See these wounds? I offer you healing. And if you follow me, your heart will begin to experience a healing you can't find anywhere else. And then I promise, just as I rose from the dead, so you will rise too. And you're going to have a new body, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And I know the deep pain that you've walked through. I'm the man of sorrows. I'm acquainted with grief. And I'm going to take my hand on that day, and I'm going to wipe away your tears. And there will be no more sickness and no more death any more. He is risen. And because He is risen, you are completely accepted and welcomed and treated as righteous by the Father. That is the heart of Christianity. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, What love that you would die in our place. And what gift that you would give us your righteousness. I pray that you would work these truths deep down in our hearts. And I pray that we would leave here this morning walking on air with joy. Because you bore our sin and you rose from the dead. Give us deep peace. Give us joy. Give us freedom. We pray. Amen. So now it's time to respond to that message. And we're going to respond with joy. And we're going to respond with peace. And we're going to respond with the freedom that he has purchased for us. And we're going to come to the table this morning. And we're going to have communion. And when you come to the table this morning, the one idea I want to be on your mind that I want you to latch on to by faith is substitution. When you eat this bread and you drink the wine, I want you to think about how Jesus pled guilty in your place. And he took your punishment. And then as you eat and as you drink, I want you to receive from Jesus. And just as he took from you, so he gives you his peace and his healing and his acceptance. He gives you his righteousness. And I want you to walk away from this table completely confident that you are welcomed and loved and accepted by the Father. And to do that by faith. Now before we eat this meal, I want to say that this meal is for Christians. For those 
who believe in Jesus. And if you do not identify yourself as a Christian this morning, I want to tell you, it is completely okay to stay in your seat and to not take this meal. Nobody will be looking at you in judgment. In fact, one of my desires as a pastor is that Redeemer Presbyterian Church is a really safe place for people to have questions, to seek, to ask honest questions about God, to not take pat answers or trite answers, but to wrestle with God. And so if you do not identify yourself as a Christian, you are completely, it's okay, stay in your seat, do not take this meal, because Jesus is very clear that those who take this meal must take this meal in a worthy manner. And to not take this meal in a worthy manner, Scripture says is not a good thing. So how do we take this meal in a worthy manner? You come completely with empty hands. Latching on to what Jesus has done for you by faith. Let him feed you this morning with his death and his resurrection. Pray, pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the risen Christ, right now seated at the right hand of God, and you welcome us into the table with a smile on your face because you delight to clear guilty sinners, and you delight to give us your righteousness. So we come forward completely empty-handed, not pointing to any righteousness of our own, but our fingers are pointing to you and saying, you, you alone are our righteousness. I pray that you would pour out your spirit on us as we eat and as we drink by faith. And we pray this in your name. Amen. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite those who are serving to come up now and just a few brief instructions. We have four stations. One, two, three, four. Simply form a line here and here down this aisle. Individuals and families, just peel off. Come to this station, come to that station, and then you can make your way back to your seat. Additionally, the bread that we have this morning, symbolizing that we all eat of one body, is gluten-free. So, there's, so if, if, you, if you have an allergy or something, know that this bread is safe for you. It's, it's, it's gluten-free bread. Additionally, um, the wine is found on the outer ring, and the juice is found on the inner ring. Table's prepared. Come just as you are.
Has everybody been served? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have met us around this table yet again faithfully giving us your life and your death on our behalf. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you welcome us. And Father, we thank you that we are counted as your daughters and as your sons, completely accepted and treated as righteous. And we thank you for how you have assured our hearts around this table. Thank you for the gift of your Son and Lord Jesus. There is none like you. For you are the Lamb who was slain and you are worthy to receive all power and glory and honor and praise forevermore. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Please stand. seeking after Jesus. If you have questions, if you want to know more, I want you to know this, that I am more than happy 
to speak with you, and I know there are many others who would love to speak with you as well. You were sitting in this service, and you didn't hear my voice, but you heard Jesus speaking to you and assuring your heart that you are forgiven and you are accepted. We're not one of those churches where you raise your hands or fill out cards, but I would love to hear. And that way, me or someone else could help you in your next steps with Jesus. And church, I'm about to pronounce God's blessing over you. And I'm going to say some words to you, and they are completely true because Jesus rose from the dead. This blessing is about how God's face shines on you. And every word I say is completely true because Jesus died and he rose again at the ultimate risk of overuse. He is risen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.